buenos días a todos, eh, a Ostolos y Costas. Es un honor tenerle aquí. Eh, Juanma Moreno, presidente del Partido Popular. Ventaja en este meeting, donde vamos a debatir, propone and share amongst uh, the members of the Andalusian People's Party and the European People's Party and other representatives of the civil society as uh, the European climate law. In order to have a more or better cities to live and to make them more sustainable, for me it's a great opportunity to say that we are spearheading this event due to the revolution that was launched by our president Juanma Moreno. We did it via the Euro climate law and energy transition law of Andalusia. And I would also like to say that the commissioner who was in charge of this depends on the president, which shows us the mainstreaming nature of the green revolution that is taking place. I'd also like to say that we are spearheading in the field of agriculture. We have the regional minister here, and we are working on carrying out sustainable water practices and the sustainability of our resources. Andalusia allows us to do this due to the geography, orography, and vegetation. It's an immense pleasure for all Andalusians to see that the green budget of the Andalusian regional government as well as other initiatives promoted by the regional government to have been chosen as good practices by the European Committee of the Regions. And we're going to talk about this throughout the morning and we'll be proposing, debating, and above all, learning from each other. Everybody's aware of the fact that, that climate neutrality is done through local and regional authorities. And I'd like to say that the government of Juan Manuel in or the Andalusian regional government has started to take the steps forward in this path cooperating with city councils, with a pact that has been signed with local authorities about climate change, so that a local action can be carried out. Our president will later on give us details about the legal framework and how it is being pushed forward. And we can talk about the adoption of this comprehensive waste law, the law for circular economy. But you must remember, you will agree with me that there are a series of factors that are extremely important in this framework. Businesses, businesses have to work closely with institutions. Businesses require to change their production systems, and that's why we're working hand-to-hand -hand with them in order to achieve all the goals that we have set out for us in this green transition. In Andalusia, we have no complexes whatsoever to speak out loud and clearly the, about our PPP, which we implement at all levels, and most particularly at this one when we're talking about the environment. The most important bed for green transition in Europe is the Green Deal by President von der Leyen. Please allow me to say that we're doing away with many myths. The left has always tried to be the defender of the ecology and the green matters, but we are proving that we can do it at all levels whatsoever. The government of Juan Manuel Moreno believes bets for rep represents and budgets all these matters in the green revolution that can go closely, hand in hand, and in conciliation with economic progress. So defending green practices is not something that belongs for, to a particular group. It belongs to whoever defends it, and this means that it is part of Juan Manuel Moreno's works. Yes, I'm delighted to have you all here. The Andalusian Popular Party is along, pulling along the same lines as the European People's Party, and we are going to focus on economic development. I'm sure this is going to be a very, very successful meeting and I do hope that we will be able to re repeat them because together we are stronger. There's no doubt about that. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I have the huge honor of giving the floor to the president of the European Committee of the Regions, Mr. Apostolos Tsikikostas.
Thank you very much for these inspiring words. Dear President, dear EPP family, ladies and gentlemen, the Conference on the Future of Europe, which was launched in uh, May, has one purpose, to let people decide on Europe's future. And the mission of the European Committee of the Regions is to ensure that the conference will go beyond Brussels and beyond the city capitals. It must reach every corner of our union. So, dear President, I would therefore like to congratulate you for holding this dialogue today. And I would just remind everyone that Europe starts in the 300 regions and the 90,000 municipalities. Europe is my region, Central Macedonia and Greece. Europe is your very beautiful region of Andalusia. And today's debate is a shining example of how our EPP family is making everything possible to take the responsibility for our common future. Ladies and gentlemen, the dreadful pandemic has affected everyone, every region, every city, every village, every community in Europe. And at the same time, it illustrated how we turn to local and regional governments, and especially to our brave public services during times of crisis. The pandemic has shown that together we are stronger. Next week, on the 1st of July, as a union, we will start allowing people to travel freely again. If Europe hadn't produced vaccines together, if Europe hadn't worked together, the health divide would be even more vast. Many regions and cities would have been left behind. So it is clear that when and what it brings added value to people's life, it is then that we need Europe. Today's debate on climate action is the perfect example. Dear President, climate neutrality is not only feasible, it is necessary. It won't be achieved in Brussels. It won't be achieved within institutional EU walls. It will be achieved here on the streets of Andalusia. Your region, after all, was one of the first to join the Covenant of Mayors back in, 20, in 2009. Your leadership, your knowledge and expertise is crucial for making Europe climate neutral by 2050, making our transport greener, making our homes energy efficient, cutting air pollution. This will happen in and with our communities. And I'm truly inspired to see that your region's budget is linked to climate action, whether it be promoting cycling, using renewable energy to run your public transport, or using EU funds to increase the bioeconomy. Your region is a pioneer of sustainable development. It makes environmental sense, but also economic sense. The economic losses caused solely by extreme weather conditions have reached 436 billion euros over the past four decades. In the worst scenarios, they will keep increasing by 170 billion euros every year. So as you understand, there is no more time to lose. We need to act now and act fast. We have to create the right environment today so our SMEs and businesses flourish and our communities adapt. We need to offer more training to the young people so that Europe can compete and lead the world in green technology. We need to work together 
to pave the way to being even more ambitious on climate resilience, to make our regions and cities greener and smarter. Saving energy and cutting emissions saves money and saves lives. Investing in sustainable transport and digital tools creates jobs, creates opportunities. So ladies and gentlemen, in the middle of the pandemic, the European Union member states agreed an unprecedented EU budget and recovery fund. Spain will have almost 70 billion euros from the EU's recovery and resilience facility, 40% of which is for climate action. A further 31 billion euros will be available for cohesion funds. Now, how funds are spent must be decided, unfortunately, between the national and the regional and local partners. And I say unfortunately, because today in Europe, I see that national governments, in their vast majority, do not involve as much as they should regions and cities. Centralization, my dear friends, will show, will slow down our recovery. Europe will recover only when the regions and the cities recover. So it is time to invest, and it is time to invest together. Invest to deliver a just and green recovery for every region, every city, and every village in Europe, rich or poor. The EPP's priorities are clear, and I call every EPP, regional or local leader, to continue to deliver smart, green projects that create long-term jobs. President, I call on you not only to join, but to lead our committee's Green Deal campaign that aims to empower, accelerate, and deliver sustainable projects in our communities. Dear friends, too many citizens today see the European Union as distant, slow, <coughs> irresponsive in some cases, and it is time to change that. But for the conference on the future of Europe to succeed, politicians at every level must listen with open ears and improve the way the EU works. Our house of European democracy has solid foundations, regional and local authorities, solid walls, the member states, and a protective roof, which is the European Union. Our committee's strong delegation to the Conference on the Future of Europe, which started last week, will represent the one million local and regional leaders in the conference. And in this great discussion, this great opportunity for Europe, the people who are representing the Committee of the Regions in this conference are people whom the citizens have entrusted their confidence, their vote, and we will honor their trust every day during this very important discussion for our future. We are your voice, and together we will make our union more democratic, more efficient, and accountable. We will bring Europe closer to its citizens. We can and we will do this together. Thank you very much for contributing in our common future.
Buenos días a todos. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I would first of all like to start by thanking the different representatives of the Civilian and Andalusian Society who have been so kind as to join us today in this important meeting. But you're going to allow me by starting uh, to uh, greet uh, the President of the European Committee of the Regions, Mr. Apostolos Chichikostas. Thank you very much for your presence here in Seville. And thank you very much for your presence in Andalusia and for the magnificent work you're carrying out for the benefit of uh, regions and cities in Europe, President of uh, the European P People's Party, who will be with us uh, online, but fortunately technology is allowing us to be able to get in touch is from different parts of our continent, the President of the European People's Party and uh, European Committee of the Regions, Mr. Kablis, you also know Seville really well, you know Andalusia really well, and you come very often, and we'd like to encourage you to continue visiting us as you have done in other occasions with your family, because it's always a great pleasure to have you amongst us. Secretary General of the Andalusian um, People's Party, Dolores, uh, MEP Dolores Metzerrat, uh, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you amongst us, the Deputy Secretary and Provincial President who's with us today from Granada, Jaén, Córdoba, Cadiz. Thank you for all these representatives uh, to being here, which shows and points out how important this meeting is. The regional ministers of the Treasury, Mr. Juan Bravo, the healthcare, Mr. Jesus Iguerre, Patricia for Culture, the spokesperson, Mr. Jose Antonio Nieto, MEB and parliamentarian and mayor of the city of Seville. Mr. Zoido, who is one of the most visible faces and most representative ones of Andalusia in the European Parliament. Mayors like the mayors of Algeciras and Estepona, two great mayors. And just like I said at the beginning of my presentation, and I'm going to speak slowly so that we can hear the interpretation, I would like to thank the representatives of civil society for being with us here today, a meeting that is particularly important for us and their presence, no doubt, at the different panels and discussions that we're going to hold this morning are making our meeting even richer and give us greater visibility. And I'm referring to the rector of the University of Seville, Miguel Angel Castro, to whom I'm extremely grateful for being here with us today. I would like to thank him for his actions and hard work, trade unions, but most of all, Nuria Lopez from one of the trade unions who has been re-elected for another four years and represents, no doubt, the voice of many many workers in Andalusia, as well as uh, the trade union at Masaja, Ricardo Serra, who's with us, Cristobal Cano, who's with us today, and Enrique Millo, who's the Secretary General for Foreign Action, without whom this would have not been carried out. I'm sure I've left someone behind in my greetings. I'm sure that maybe I will never be greeted by the persons I've forgotten, but this is what happens when you have to greet so many important personalities like we have present here today. I'd like to say from the bottom of my heart, it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to inaugurate these, this meeting, which I consider is uh, very timely organized by the European People's Party that focuses on the important role that has to be played by our villages, cities, and regions in order to stop the deterioration of our planet and of our land. I have the intuition that it has not been a decision that has been made casually having chosen Seville and Andalusia for the meeting, not only for the attract, of Andalusia and Seville. I think it's also the result of, of trying to acknowledge the humble efforts that we're making from the regional government in Andalusia, and we're doing that promoting initiatives that will allow us to come closer as soon as possible to complying with the sustainable development objectives that we have set forward for us at a worldwide level, so that a region like ours, which 
which is vulnerable, which is important, also has to take it upon its shoulders and do something quickly. Assuming also the postulates of the European climate law, the so-called law of laws that has to guide the different steps and decisions that are going to be made in our continent, the European continent, in the next 30 years, and which finally, finally, finally will be adopted tomorrow. A law that, if you'll allow me, is going to take me back to a memory that goes back a year ago. Because a year ago, uh, by video conference, uh, due to the pandemic, I had uh, the immense honor of being a speaker before the European Committee of the Regions. And I talked here about the essential role that's played by regions in the struggle against climate change. There is no doubt whatsoever that climate change is a global objective, but we're only going to achieve it from individual action as well as local and regional ones. Because if we don't build on the awareness on climate change and challenges from bottom top, the strategies will be useless. A strategy, and I'm convinced of this, must go from bottom top. We have to produce awareness at the grassroots, and you start doing this with information. There's lots of a lack of information about uh, climate sensitivity, environmental matters, which is the result of people talking about um, matters and denying them. We need environmental actions that are responsible. We need to educate in schools, high schools, universities, but above all, we have to lead by example from the public sphere, from the administrations, to ensure that we achieve our main aim, zero paper, reducing the carbon footprint. And when facing a challenge like this, uh, you have to be strong. You have cannot be passive, and you cannot do it half-heartedly. When we have finally been able to do away with the myth that told us that economic growth was incompatible with being less contaminating, as you know, we've heard it very often, and we've been able to do it do away with it, and you can build and grow and thrive without polluting, and we're going to do it. But we're also promoting sustainable policies. We've created green employment, and we have created progress without having to exhaust our natural resources, which should be available for future generations. But there's also something that I would like to highlight today. The circular economy is also going to be a huge opportunity for employment and future for many villages in the hinterland, and not only in Spain, but throughout the European Union that is studying, suffering from population deterioration. And we also have to talk about our blue resource, a country like ours that has nearly 1,000 kilometers of a coastline with a two for facades, one looking onto the Atlantic and one onto the Mediterranean, has to look and cover it bravely and clearly. The time has come, and that's why I would like to talk about uh, binding the Green Deal with the recovery from the pandemic, and I congratulate the EU for this, because it's going to allow us to multiply our investments and accelerate the transition to an um, environment-neutral Europe. Much before the 2050, I think that we're going to be able to reduce that deadline. And reducing net emissions of greenhouse gases considerably, too. Mr. President, you know, like everybody else, that uh, uh, Europe has a lot to lose in the post-pandemic world. The investment of many millions is representing an opportunity which for me is a historical and unique opportunity and unrepeatable in the short term for many regions and for many cities in Andalusia because it allows us to be able to go beyond what is done at an average in Spain and the rest of Europe. The European Union has a name which we should not only applaud, but is to support. And it is to do away with the gap, the differences of prosperity and wealth amongst regions. And I think that after the pandemic, with these funds, we have a huge opportunity to do away with this 
gap that exists in many parts of Southern Europe. We have the time of accelerating our production model, producing green progress, and using the support of sun energy, which we have in the South, green hydrogen, wind, ICTs, biomedicine, which are all industries where we're already strong, but where we can not only be a spearheading, but also a world and planet reference. We are ready to make the most of this opportunity. In fact, we are utterly convinced of this in Europe. And to pull it under Lucia, where she should be opening lots of opportunities for our better prepared generations. But there's only one thing I'd like to add. We need to get the aid, and we all have to be very good at managing it. And that's why I would like to publicly thank you for making your voice be heard so that the European Council and the EU will make the grants come to Spain so that they can invest it in the projects that have been developed by Spain. But we also have to double our efforts to increase the involvement of cities and regions. And I would like to insist on this last fact because I find it particularly important. They're not only important from an institutional standpoint and its balance, but I would also like to add that they are absolutely key to make sure that this aid will reach every single corner of the European continent in a capillary fashion, going into all the city councils that we can found in our continent, but because being close to the citizen makes it easier to do things better. In brief, it states trust, co-governance, so that these funds can trickle down to cities and regions. I'm absolutely sure that we will be able to go further and be more efficient from an economic and social standpoint. This is key. This is key. And that is why I'd like to insist, like I said last Thursday when I spoke to President Sanchez, and I think that the voice of Andalusia is going to be heard loud and clear. There cannot be economic recovery, a full economic recovery, and we cannot lose a historical opportunity like the one we have ahead of us without governance with governments and regions when it comes to managing European funds. This is an objective that is clear and essential for us, and which, unfortunately, as uh, the President of the European Committee of Regions has said, we believe is not being done appropriately. I think we are lagging behind. We have a conference with the President at the end of the month. And I think that many European member states are not having an appropriate view from centralization. And I think uh, Spain is doing the same thing. And we have to try to avoid making this mistake. And both the region of Andalusia, as well as many others in Spain, are going to ask uh, to have the direction of these projects be changed. So far, we still do not know what are this, what will be the criteria for sharing out these uh, funds. I would like to conclude talking about something that I'm very enthusiastic about. I think this is something that we have all worked towards together, and we have called it the Green Revolution here in Andalusia as the president of this wonderful land. This region is even larger than eight or nine European countries with nearly 90,000 square kilometers and 8.5 million inhabitants that have been uh, recorded. And there are many more that are not actually in our census, but there are many dreams in Andalusia that we want to fulfill. We want to ensure that we want to leave the future generations in Andalusia that is livable. I have this opportunity to promote these changes as the president of the Andalusia. 
I think that one of our uh, main features should be this fight. We want the European institutions to recognize that Andalusia is in the front, forefront for its determination, for its commitment, and recognize that Andalusia and its citizens are very much aware and sensitive to this climate change. This is a land that is being uh, threatened by this situation, and we really take it seriously. We really, really take it seriously. Andalusia wants to reach zero waste, and this will mean that the government and society must be on board. The town council, city councils, and uh, county council will obviously be involved in this, in this uh, endeavor. We must obviously push for this uh, changes. There are many initiatives that I am not going to list here because we have uh, made uh, very important decisions here in Andalusia. We will, be con we will continue to work towards this. We are also taking legislative measures with new laws such as the circular economy law. But what is most important is social awareness. And this is why we must all build this social awareness to Together, there are still sectors in our society that don't understand or, in fact, deny this situation. They deny this threat that we are facing throughout the planet due to climate change. And this is obviously going to be cause disruptions in society and also in the countries and migratory flows. This is the main challenge that we'll be facing as a society once we overcome the pandemic. This is the main challenge in Europe. And this is a challenge that we have taken on board. We have no complexes in this regard. And because we will be leaving our, the future generations a better legacy, we're going to make Europe a the best region for employment and the future. So this is our goal. And for this, I thank all of you, all the people present here at this event, all the authorities and colleagues that have come from all over Europe. We are very proud. We obviously welcome you all in this universal city, in this marvelous city that is Seville, and also in our autonomous community that is always uh, shows us hospitality and welcomes anyone who comes here. So I will encourage you not only to come today, but also many more times. We want you to always keep Andalusia in your agenda and in your hearts. Thank you very much.
which we are going to start this first uh, round table, this first panel. We are already somewhat behind schedules, and one of the most important tasks of a moderator is to get the uh, debate moving. I am not going to make any introduction. I want to thank the presence of all of you. I want to thank the European People's Party group to have a hosted this event here in Andalusia. And we have very important people here. I think it's absolutely wonderful to see all these people together. Some of them have to leave immediately because they have to catch a flight. Other people will be connecting with us online. And though this has to be done in 15 minutes. That's all the time we have. So we're going to go very quickly. After that, we will have another two round tables. And we want this event to end and around 1, 1 1.30, so that we can also have some lunch all together. So I have the honor and the luck, I would say, because the person I'm going to present now is important, not only for the work that she carries out, but because I'm a friend. I have here Dolores Montserrat, who is a, a member of the European Parliament, head of the Spanish delegation of the European People's Party, and also a member of the Committee on the Environment environment at the European Parliament. So she is very knowledgeable about the topic that we will be talking here today. She knows exactly what is the situation of the regions and European regions and how they can face the challenges. And I have also been informed that the European Parliament will be voting tomorrow about the European climate law. And our president, Juanma Moreno, was the rapporteur of the report that was presented to the Commission and the European Parliament. So I would say that we have coordinated all this work very well. So I would like to give the floor to Dolores. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with a friend. Uh, you know, we have these Catalan, Catalonians that are always having to talk about coexistence and constitution, etc. But in fact, Catalonia is half Andalusian. Thank you very much to the President Juan Moreno, Chichini President Chichini Costas, the members of the European People's Group. I think we have to be very clear. We have to be proud of being members of the People's Party and European People Party because we are the ones who have most uh, of the governments in Europe. We have the largest group in the European Parliament. We are the ones who are leading all our work. Also, we have Ursula von der Leyen in the European Commission. We are also the ones who are running the Committee of the European Regions. And that is why Mr. Chichi Costas is here to with us today. So we have to do the same in Andalusia as we do in Europe. And we have to also become the Spanish government in the future because we see that our policies really work. And all this stems from our regions, our villages, and our cities. I want to also agree of the MEPs who have come to this event. We are going to be talking today with also Mr. Gonzalez Pons, who is an MEP and vice president of the PPE group, the whole of the PPE family as well, and also Juan Ignacio Soido, who is doing a great job in the European Parliament to protect the uh, agricultural and livestock sector. I want to talk, say something about this world in which we have a more born world to develop our life part of the world in which we are carrying out research. And this world does not only belong to us, we are simply safeguarding that uh, world for future generations. And we must pass on this legacy in better conditions to the future generations who will inherit it. So there is this intergenerational link between our grandparents, our parents, us, and our children. So we are making a huge effort because this goes beyond us. But we are now facing a huge challenge, and this challenge can only be overcome if every village, every city, every region is involved in obtaining our, this goal, which is to provide a legacy to our children that is better than what we have today. We have to protect the environment, we have to protect our health, and we have to create jobs. And this is something that is possible. This is called sustainability. 
todo el gobierno, gobierno de hoy Mamorino, está y aquí muchísimos de vosotros, habéis entendido a la percepción con la puesta en marcha de la revolución well, yeah, verde, en la que habéis invertido más de, un, uh, más de mil millones, habéis invertido más de mil millones de euros para crear 20.000 puestos de empleo. Y que está creciendo ya hasta el día en una de las regiones líderes en Europa en la lucha contra el cambio climático y siempre buscando esta compatibilización en la creación de empleo. Es una cosa de vida compatible con el medio ambiente, una oportunidad de crecimiento basada en el desarrollo sostenible. Es cuidar de nuestro entorno, crea empleo y genera riqueza. Es lo que debemos comprender, es lo que habéis comprendido vosotros todos los otros integrados por la Plan de Andalucía, es lo que tenemos que transmitir a todos y cada uno de los ciudadanos de Europa. De ahí la importancia de que sea a nivel local y regional donde incidamos en esas políticas de resiliencia. Y ahí otra gran reflexión para nosotros importante como Parlamento y para el Parlamento es que en nuestro entorno rural, cuidando de nuestros agricultores, de nuestros ganaderos, de nuestros pescadores, que lejos de ser una amenaza, son los mejores aliados para ser sostenibles en el modelo de vida. Es nuestra ciudad, mejorando la calidad del aire, utilizando los transportes públicos sostenibles, estamos mejorando la calidad de vida de todos. This is how we are improving the life of all our citizens. I always no tell people that Europe is not a rich in natural resources. I'm talking here about oil or natural gas. What we were simply doing was to use these resources and creating waste, and this waste was something that was damaging for our environment and our planet. But we, are no, we now know where we want to go. We have to recycle, and this uh, waste can become an important resource for Europe. And the circular economy is going to allow us to ensure that we can cut back depopulation. Juan Moreno explained this very well. The circular economy, we used to have all the waste produced by pigs and we can use this as biomass, which in turn becomes high quality jobs. So the citizens of a city or a village feel responsibility for their forest. They have a sense of ownership. They want to take care of the air, the environment, and this is something that all the economic sectors in Andalusia are doing. People enjoy living in rural areas with better air quality, with a low population density and better public services. And COVID-19 and the pandemic has shown us how weak we are, how weak we are, how vulnerable we are. We thought that we were invisible. We were thought that the pandemic has simply destroyed the world that we have created over the centuries because the pandemic affects everyone equally. And we have realized, which is the problem we have. So climate, health, and economy are intrinsically interrelated. And this is what you are working on in the regional government of Andalusia. I have just seen the regional minister of health, with whom I am also a friend. We must encourage our farmers and the tourist sector to take care of the environment, because if we don't do it correctly, this will have an impact on the fields, on the optimum production, in the development of the agricultural holdings. This will also help us to fight against the drought and make sure that there is enough water. We must also manage the forest better to prevent forest fires. And at the same time, we must also create better protection for our coastal areas. And we have to ensure that transport, water, and energy must be more resilient, especially those that are more critical. And we must also increase awareness about the threats that there can be derived from climate change. We have to improve our health system that threats to our health due to climate change is something that we have seen that has grown over the years. There's greater forest fires. There's also a larger spreading of different diseases, new type of diseases. Therefore, the health system must be one step ahead to be able to face these challenges, that, or especially to unknown diseases, uh, previously unknown diseases in Europe, just as we have done here in Andalusia. How is this going to be done? 
using the European funds? Who has pushed for the European funds and making sure that they reach Spain? Well, the People's Party, the European People's Party, we are the ones who have done this in a record time. We have been able to achieve three things, European funds, ownership of uh, the Europeans of these funds. The European funds do not belong to any ideology or any government. These are not funds uh, to create a new uh, planet or to simply spend it in a wasteful manner. It is simply, it should simply be used to create jobs, jobs, and jobs, make sure that our economy is the most competitive through circular economy, to ensure that there is a transition from the analogical era to the digital era. These are funds that are also going to strengthen our health system so that they can be more resilient. These are also funds that have been paid by all the taxpayers in Europe, and this is why the European Parliament demands uh, transparency to make sure that this money will reach every single region, every single corner of Andalusia. This is why Europe is leading the fight against climate change, and this is why Europe, Europe has decided to create the Europe for Health to try to avoid the repetition of the situation that existed initially with this pandemic, and this is why we're talking about the digital certificate and the passport, because Europe is one of the most visited regions in the world, and we want to make sure that people can travel to our regions safely, and this is why the European, Spanish, and Andalusian People's Party are there with the people to try to overcome this situation, this crisis that is health, uh, environmental, health, and economic crisis. And I think that we have to focus on this. I thank you very much. I think Andalusian is, Andalusia is doing a great job, and you are like a mirror in which the other regions have, have to look in. Thank you very much, uh, Dolores. Uh, thank you very much for the work you carry out as the head of the uh, European People's Party. I know that you are doing a great job. These needs, these priorities that you have mentioned here for Andalusia and in Spain are something that you are always defending, working towards in Europe. And I think that is the spirit, uh, the work ethics that should exist. And remember what she said, climate change, health, economy, they all go hand in hand. So we must continue to work in this line. Thank you very much. I know you have to catch a flight very soon. You have to fly out of this event. And I really, we really thank you for the effort you have made to be here with us today. I have just received a message, and we are going to listen to the vice president of the EPP group directly from the European Parliament, Mr. Esteban González Pons, he said that he couldn't wait anymore because he has to take the floor in a debate at the European Parliament. So he simply wants to greet you very warmly. He has been looking at the streaming, but he has not been. He will not be able to take part in this event because he has to also participate in a debate in the European Parliament. These are things that happen when you are live. And I will move on to the next uh, speaker. We we now have with us someone who really wanted to be with us physically, but uh, this has not been possible because she is now in the Spanish Senate. She is taking part in the vote for the approval of a new national park in Spain. We are talking about the Sierra de las Nieves National Park here in Andalusia. This vote is taking place today. And this is why our regional minister of agriculture, Carmen Crespo, is there. This is why she has uh, recorded a video. And I would like to request uh, the technicians to show us this video. Go ahead. 
As the Regional Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Sustainable Development, I want to welcome you all, especially the MEPs, who will be talking about very crucial event, uh, issues, which are the climate in Europe and also agriculture. At this time, I would say that these are essential issues for the Andalusian government. I want to thank the Spanish uh, delegation of MEPs who are in Andalusia today. This provides us a window to explain what we are doing today. First of all, I would like to say that I'm very proud that the president of the Junta de Andalusia, the president of all Andalusia, has been elected the rapporteur of this European climate law. Why so? Because Andalusia is in the very south of Europe. We are also impacted by the climate change, and we are committed to fighting climate change. We are committed, a firm commitment. And this is something that this government is very much invested in. And this is uh, shown by the fact that we have this Green Revolution that is led by the uh, president of the regional, uh, the regional government of Andalusia. I want to also agree to Los Montserrat and Esteban Gonzalez Pons and the moderator, Jose Enrique Milla, who is the secretary Attorney General for Foreign Action. In this sense, you are our window, a window to explain what is the Andalusian Green Revolution. It is a way to do politics differently. Until now, all we heard was people talk about the environment, but now we are looking at concepts. So everything has changed, not only the climate neutral commitment in 2050, but also the development of a law that had not been a implemented, and we are talking about the climate change law. We have developed the different elements of the law, the interdepartmental committee, the action plan for the climate, uh, action plan for the climate. These are things that this government has done, and this reflects the firm commitment that we have to fight against climate change. And we have also done things that are quite a different from what has done before. We have already measure the carbon footprint. We plan to do this across the regional government of Andalusia. Imagine what is the situation. This is an administration that is very uh, comprehensive and a, a government that is has an impact on the 8 million lives of Andalusia. So we are measuring this carbon footprint, uh, just like it happens in other regions in Spain. But we're also looking into the different agencies, in FOCA, the airplanes of the Infoca, not only the ministerial structure. So we are not talking here about measuring carbon in any way, but we are doing it in a very accurate and specific way. To do this, we are cooperating with the different uh, cities and villages so that they can also put into place a climate change plan. This administration works hand in hand with the municipal governments. Also the standards, air quality standards in Andalusia. We are involved in the measurement of all of these parameters and find what kind of changes have to be made to ensure that we have a good air quality which has an impact on the health of all Andalusia. Andalusia also has many water problems. So uh, the western part of Andalusia has a completely different situation from the eastern part. We have to take into account of different bases, the Guadalete, the Guadalquivir, uh, and others. And these basins really are governed by the Spanish government. But we do have in place drought plans, water management plans, and we are also uh, doing this through the resource that we can achieve from the water cannon. Before this government arrived to, uh, to power, they we had to pay 8 million euros because we were not building the necessary water treatment plants. We already have 300 uh, water treatment plants that, uh, for which there have been a call for proposal. This will allow us not only to treat the water, 
the wastewater. But, and I think the most uh, green thing that we can do is uh, treat water. And this treatment will also allow us to have more water available. And this water that has been treating allows uh, the farmers to use it to irrigate their lands. And we are now in a space where there's a restriction, and it can also be used in the cities. Water is essential. We must continue to work on this issue and try to make the most of these resources. So the Next Generation Fund and all the plans and the initiatives that are carried out in our region should be under this fund because this would allow us to move forward both economically and environmentally. The Rules, which is a large a dam or reservoir, the San Silvestre Tunnel, or the expansion of the Carboneras Water Treatment Plan. But there's different activities that the government has to take over and carry them out. And the next generation funds are essential for this. We're also focusing on our parks. This is a region in which many of the uh, territory is protected. We have a huge amount of land that is protected. We are working on biodiversity. We have very important European plans, for example, for, uh, regarding the links. We have already doubled the number of links or the uh, Caper Cayley that lives in a Doñana. We now, uh, we are going to approve now the Sierra de las Nieves National Park in, in Ronda. Today, like I said, this uh, park will be designated as such by the Senate, and this will have an impact also on the environment. And this will have an impact as well on sustainable development. The fact that we have three national parks means that we are the region with the largest number of national parks. We believe that all the natural areas have to be taken into account. We are at a stage where depopulation is important, so we have to make the most of our rural areas and natural areas that can produce economic results, not only from the point of view of environmental tourism, but also as investment, as large as agriculture investment, restoration, the possibilities, providing additional possibilities for a rural area. Giving the opportunity to be able to remove or add elements to the territory, and to do this, you need to strengthen it. I'm referring to sustain sustainable hunting. I'm referring to agriculture, sustainable agriculture, but even more so making it sustainable. And of course, elements like uh, different types of forestry treatments, ensuring that uh, what Andalusia is doing is clear. All of this is the green revolution, the green revolution of the facts. And we are committed with Europe in the European law of climate, uh, by which we implement our climate action plan. We move on forward with the climate change law and also with another law that's going to be a pioneer layer when it comes to environmental possibilities for the future, as well as the post-pandemic business needs. In this case, we're talking about the law for circular economy, which is going to be one of the most complex and used ones in Spain. So we want it to be closely bounded to production and provide possibilities to other productive industry, so it's not about manufacturing using and throwing away, but manufacturing using and reusing. So this government is fully committed with the European goals. And of course, we're going to do it with responsibility and uh, non-stop, with possibilities that will give uh, economic opportunities for our citizens and help us to invest in rural areas, which uh, today is absolutely essential to the pandemic. That is why the Andalusian region President and all its team are committed with Europe in the European Green Deal and with the Andalusian citizens that are particularly aware today of the preservation of our nature and the fight against climate change. Thank you very much.
Creo que escuchando a la consejera uno se da cuenta de la capacidad que tiene Andalucía de la consejera de 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 la consejera de but that gives us a very general view of what Andalusia is doing today. And finally, to conclude with this first panel, even though we're rather late on schedule, we have listened to the person who's in charge in the field of agriculture and sustainability in Europe. But now we're going to listen to the person who is there in the fire lines. My colleague, Mr. Francisco Gutierrez, who's the Secretary General for the Environment of the Andalusian Region of Government. Well, thank you very much. This is the second piece of information that Enrique has said. Be short and brief. We're late on schedule, so please. The first thing I'm going to do is shorten the greetings. It's a pleasure for me to be here with such good friends. Some of them I've already been able to greet personally, and I will greet others later on. It's been a very, very long time since I last saw some others because our daily work does not make us feel terribly happy. But for me today is a happy day and a double for the ministry, regional ministry, I represented you to the meeting that we have today. And secondly, because of the adoption of the general part of the law by which the third national park of Andalusia is created, which is Park Sierra de las Nieves, which was already a natural park, and which today will become a national park. Como ven, los frentes son As you know, in Seville, we have a very broad focus to come. Trabajo, you know that eh, there is a lot of work to do. And what we have to clima, focus on is on the European climate law, la la a law with which the European Union wants at an international level to show their leadership, to show their leadership vis-à-vis -vis other economies in their struggle against climate change. They are actually being able to do it and the climate repeatedly states it. But if we are leaders at the European level, what is clear from the previous speakers is that Andalusia is leading at a national level. When it comes to the struggle against climate change, we can't say anything about the national government who have adopted a climate change law when other governments have had to But in we have been so since the beginning of our legislature, and we have been defending it because the delegation with which we attended COP20 We have this leadership because we have already drafted the strategic environmental declaration, which I signed it two days ago, which will be finally adopted after it undergoes the regular legal proceedings for a short period of time. We have this leadership because we're going to be able to develop a climate change law that has been established with a full-blown development of the law in this legislature, which is those who know parliamentary dynamics and have known it for some time and how slow the previous administration has been, will see it as a challenge, a landmark of Andalusian, the Andalusian region, which shows our commitment because we have a general secretariat for climate change. The NOM is a very long general secretariat of, water, of the environment, water resources, and climate change, the director general for environmental quality and climate change. And we also have the commissioner for climate change and transformation, energy transformation and transition. So and the leadership of Andalusia at a national level is very, very clear. 
but we also are conveying it in our relationships with town councils. We have given city councils a visor for climate change scenarios, so throughout the different tasks they carry out, they may be able to detect the different scenarios they're going to face in the next few years or decades related with the multiple variables that are involved in climate change. The regional minister has said this very clearly, and I'm not going to repeat myself, but it is clear in the guide that city councils have available to draft a local regulations. So the leadership could be clear. It's leadership that is visible in meetings like today, where we've heard about the European law presentation, as was mentioned by the president of the Andalusian regional government. Um, we're aware of climate change today. We know what consequences are. We're not going to be one of the regions that is going to suffer one of the resources of climate change because we're going to put the right measures to do it. We know which are our weaknesses, but we also know which are our strengths. We know as a European Union our opportunities because any crisis will allow for opportunities. It allows for opportunities of transformation, and transformation will be achieved uh, in the economy by the circular economy law, and this has been highlighted by it. We're also going to achieve it throughout the Andalusian regional government with that important law for all the region, as is the LISTA, the lay to promote the sustainability of the Andalusian territory, where we're going to be able to transform regions, cities, and areas. So we are aware of the challenge that we have ahead, but we are also aware of our opportunities, because if we are going to face climate change sooner, we will have experience, we will acquire knowledge and technological abilities that maybe in the future will allow us to teach the rest of Europe about them, because sooner or later, the northern, most northern regions will find themselves in the same situation. But right now, Europe should be looking towards the south, because this is where the desertification process is starting and which may end up by reaching Central Europe. For the time being, we have it here. Hence, events like these where we see the commitment of the European Union, the commitment of the Committee of the Regions and the European People's Party are important because we feel the support of Europe. We are asking Europe to look towards the South, but thanks to the European People's Party, we are feeling their support. Where we should be moving towards to is to a better understanding of the struggle against climate change and the needs of southern regions like Andalusia. It is true that we have to promote a decarbonization of the economy, but it's not only that. We also need to promote something else, and uh, the recent actions at a European Council level, we have seen that we have to reduce CO2. Uh, carbon sinks, our forests, our fields, our coasts are wonderful carbon sinks, and we are far more competitive there than other European regions. So we don't only have to look towards the east and towards the decarbonization of certain economies at the east, but the European Union should also look south. We believe that this understanding exists. If we want an Andalusia that is greener, we need to count upon Europe's commitment. And for those of us who are at the trenches every day, like Enrique said, fighting against climate change and fighting for the protection of the environment, we see that the greener Andalusia can be achieved and that we have the support of the European People's Party for it. So thank you very much for the help that you are always giving us. Thank you very much, Francis, for what you have told us and for 
being able to keep within the time limits and your summary is very useful. Look at what's happening in such a few days in Andalusia and you can see that there's knowledge, vision of the future, quality of the work that's carried out and vision. And we're going to make contributions from Andalusia to the rest of Europe so we know what we're going to do because we are paving a certain way. On In Monday, we presented in Granada the... Uh, initiative Andalusia for the future of Europe so that the voice of Andalusia can be heard loud and clear in the rest of the Europe. We've seen how this national park is being um, approved here. We'll see that uh, all the different uh, projects that we've been in involved in in Andalusia will be heard about tomorrow. And this morning, we've also heard that there is yet a lot to do. So I am not going uh, to go on, but give the floor to the next panel. And now we're going to have the opportunity of hearing the moderator, which is Cathy de Miguel, who is the representative of the Andalusian Regional Government in Andalusia, in Brussels, sorry. And we'll also have with us our dear friend, very good friend, who have battled together, Mr. Juan Ignacio Zoido, MEP, And we will have online presentations by Miguel Arias Cañete and also face-to-face -face Ricardo Ceja from Asaja, Andalusia, whom I would like to ask to come to the stage. So we're going to start with the second panel. Sorry for the delay, and please forgive us because we have online our first panelist, this luxury panel. As a presentation, I'd like to say that we have three magnificent experts uh, for the second panel. We're going to start with three good friends and three experts, like I said before. So whatever is said is going to be fruitful and in any event extremely positive because we're talking about three huge experts. So, Ms. Gelarias Cañete, who does not need an introduction. I would 
only like to say, Miguel, that you're looking very handsome, by the way. Miguel, as you all know, has been the Minister of Agriculture, Minister for the Environment. He's been former Commissioner, European Commissioner for Energy and Action, and I think uh, that he has reached um, the maximum political level that can be reached at uh, the European Parliament. Parliament. And if we talk about agriculture and climate change, he can give us a general overview. I think that Miguel's presentation is going to be very positive so that we can understand what the role of agriculture has been and or the role it has played along this action because this has been like uh, the element that has actually staged it. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The international community adopted an objective a long time ago, which was to um, reduce global warming as much as possible about a series of actions had to be carried out for this, not only in the European Union, but also in other countries. And this has has been one of, uh, the European Union has been one of uh, the first economies that has said that they would achieve this goal for 2050, focusing on climate um, neutrality, zero emissions, but this requires important objectives. There is not only a very ambitious objective, which is joined by the 2030 one, which is to reduce emissions by 30 percent by 2030. And this cannot be achieved unless, uh, you know, the goals are clearly set, and even more so in agriculture. We need to have healthy and wholesome food that are produced sustainably. But for this, we need to have good carbon sinks. The administration is responsible for 10% of the emissions. And until the Kyoto Protocol, well, it wasn't clear which sections had to carry out the reduction of emissions and different actions after the European Council at the end of 2040 is the farming and agricultural and livestock rearing industry included in this effort. And, but it is done in an ad hoc fashion because the European Council requests the Commission to give measures to diversify sustainable production and uh, food, sustain, the production of sustainable food, which is what is uh, requested, and also regulate the greenhouse gas emissions and the sequestration of these gases in agricultural practice and different of provisions are made to try to see how the agricultural sector can do something about it. So in May 2018, a law was issued where it was stated how this could be done, focusing on transportation, construction, and removal of waste, as well as different details. But there is a far more specific uh, law that is issues where there is a regulation of greenhouse gases which result from land use and forestry for 2030. This regulation stated that each state was to make sure that between 2021 and 2025 and 2025 and 2030 could not be higher than the ones produced in carbon sinks. So on the 14th of July of the following year, there is a law which establishes how the process should take place for 55 which is going to be a very ambitious project. Likewise, when the new common agriculture and policy is drafted, a focus is made on its goals. 
for different sectors, but among them we want to increase the productivity of the agricultural sector, improve the quality of food production, and to have a better and more sustainable use of resources with a good preservation of environment and forestry resources. It is true that agriculture represents 10.3% of the total EU emissions. 70% of emissions comes from the animal husbandry sector. And it has also been known that since the 1990s, when the CAP was not a, including these actions for emission reduction, the farming industry has reduced it in 20%. So there's been an increase of production and a reduction of emissions. 55% of emissions are due to metal and uh, the others to NO2 and uh, nitrous oxide. The European Union has underscored the following idea, which may seem controversial, but it is part of a strategy that they have called from the farm to the table. So to, it meant that food had to be produced faster, reducing the use of crop protection products 50% to avoid health problems in the future. And it was felt that if this was well managed, you could provide added value and reduce costs. But what I would like to point out is that farmers are in a unique situation because they can have carbon sinks. And this is something that society has to compensate them for. And it is neither acknowledged nor compensated today because there are no regulations that have the right framework for farmers to have this taken into account because they have to reduce emissions in their different practices, whether it's animal husbandry or agriculture. But they not only can receive the support of CAP, but from other sources, and amongst them, the acknowledgement of their contribution to carbon sinks. That is why the European Commission is going to present new policies on carbon sequestration, because it's going to lead us to a new business model, and that may provide farmers with an additional possibility to solve problems. So summarizing the contribution of agriculture to avoiding climate change is, first of all, to adapting to temperature increases. If we are able to ensure that all countries abide by their commitments, we can reduce global warming, because if we don't so, the impact on agricultural practice is going to be very high. But we also have to mitigate emissions from agriculture, farming, animal husbandry, and others. It requires technological innovation, changing technologies and techniques and practices used. But if we all contributed to agricultural sequ carbon sequestration by agricultural practice, then we will be giving a sector the, which has proven how resilient they are during the pandemic a lot of support. Society has to acknowledge the contribution made by farmers. There's one thing I'd like to say. It is true that the EU is leading and spearheading efforts like these, but it is also true that our policies are carried out at a regional and local level. And I would like, therefore, personally to congratulate the Andalusian regional government for taking these policies really, really seriously, and because they're implementing all the necessary resources for these policies to see the light and ensure that Andalusia is making a contribution to fighting against climate change. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Miguel. As usual, your presentation is very, very clear, and it has focused on core factors, which I think are going to be a very good starting point to talk with Ricardo Serra and Ignacio Zoido. Everybody who operates in this field knows that this is a crucial stage for us. Juan Ignacio and Ricardo know this. Tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, we have the trilogy between the Commission, Parliament, and Council to conclude the CAP nego negotiation. And if it all concludes well, let us hope it's going to be better for some than others. 
so that on Monday and Tuesday in Strasbourg, it will be adopted under the French presidency. It's not very clear yet. It depends more than on Monday or Tuesday, not so much on Monday or Tuesday as on tomorrow and Friday. And this is important because one of the vindications of the farmers is that uh, they're asked for more commitment, they may be given less, and I think uh, that Miguel has talked about something very, very important, which is the activity of farmers on the role they play with carbon sinks. Juan Ignacio, I think, uh, Juan Ignacio has to catch a train, so would you like to take the floor first in case you need to leave, and then Ricardo and myself can stay here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you see this afternoon there's a mini plenary session in Brussels and I have to arrive as soon as possible because there are two important debates that are taking place this evening. I would first of all like to thank uh, the People's Party of the Committee of the Regions and Juan Moreno, President of the People's Party in Andalusian, President of the Andalusian Regional Government, for organizing such interesting meetings like the one we're holding today, because it shows how interested he is and the commitment with the Green Deal. Not only that, it's also giving importance to agriculture as a strategic industry in Spain. And I do hope that the current government in Spain had this strategic vision of agriculture and farming in Spain. We are here today to study in depth what the future is going to be. But apart from the challenges that we have ahead of us, I think that we should also acknowledge what has been achieved in the past two and a half years because Juan Manuel Morena has only been in power for two and a half years at the Andalusian regional government. And despite this, he has managed to achieve many things, so many things that Andalusia has become a benchmark in European environmental matters. Thanks to Juan Manuel Moreno, Andalusia has gone from being lagging behind to become the spearheading country and region in these elements, and making sure that uh, they are avant-garde and novel solutions in Europe. To hold this event with this light and in this environment in Seville is something that we have to be grateful for, because we have chosen just the right place to hold this meeting. This was uh, the gate towards the Americas in the past, and it is today the gate of this modern Andalusia developed by Juan Manuel Moreno. We're delighted to be here in Seville, and I'm even more delighted to talk about agriculture and our commitment with the Green Deal, and to do it with people like Miguel Arias, whom I believe has been a reference for all of us, not only in politics, but also somebody who's convinced about European politics and has not only done that, but managed to direct the energy policy of Europe and climate matters. No, también so, de Ricardo Serra. I'm also happy Yo to be here with si Ricardo Serra. En he is a, nivel a nacional, reference point in Copa within Coyeca, a Saja europeo, in Copa Coyeca at the European level. Ricardo Serra, Ricardo Serra is the man to go to. He is always a professional. He has always rigorously defended the uh, farmers. And being here also with Cati de Miguel is important for me because we have been been friends for many years, and we have shared many fights to achieve certain policies. The agriculture sector, the agri-food sector, and sustainability. When we talk about these issues, they are the best people to be in the same debate. Over the past years, when we talked about agriculture and sustainability, well, these are topics that go hand in hand. So we have to acknowledge the efforts made by the agri-food sector to be able to reach the Paris Accords. Miguel Arias and Miguel Arias Cañete was a very important person to achieve those agreements. And I think it's important also to Las quote something de CO2 for the greenhouse house uh, green has em emission in the agricultural sector only represents 1% percent of all emissions. In particular, those people who accuse the farmers, the European farmers, as the people to be blamed, I think 
they are completely in the no wrong. Es que uno, cuanto, And the problem here is that this is just done by several es que radical este activists. This, this course has become the norm in some uh, sectors of the European Commission, including the Dutch socialist Don Timmermans, who is part of the member of the trilogy, and he is trying to avoid that this agreement can be reached. He is trying to impose his green ideology, which is radical, instead of basing it on scientific criteria. I think that this green crusade eh, levantando en Europa contra in el Europe, sector agroalimentario no tiene precedente y cualquiera que tenga los no pies en la tierra sabe que no hay personas que estén más preocupadas por el clima que los propios agricultores y cito a Delibes cuando decía que si el cielo es tan alto es porque lo levantaron los campesinos de tanto mirarlo por tanto ellos, los agricultores y sus familias son so the farmers and their families are the ones who Ellos depend the most on the climate. They're the ones who suffer the most from droughts, from flooding, from heavy rains, and also y from extreme temperatures. And climate change is making these situations worse, and they have increased the frequency. This is why the farmers have been working already for decades to ensure that the uh, farming can be sustainable, and they have been reducing the emissions. Otra cifra que creo I would que like es muy to give you another figure that I think is important. In the past 25 years, it, 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 the tractor's emission has been reduced by 95%. I think this is something that everyone should be aware of. The farmers are ecologists, they are environmentalists, even before this term was used, and this was something that they did before it became part of an ideology. Farmers are important to decontaminate the world as the commissioner del propio Arias Cañete has mentioned, so they are also, industria. then this is a, something that can also be reflected in industry and the Andalus. energy sector. Los I want to give you another example. De la de Andalucía, the Dehesas and Forests in Andalusia are que large a carbon las emisiones y ayudan a They absorb la the emissions and y algo slow down to certification. También Andaluz. Y doy otra This also que happens que with the olive uh, farms. Se que una It is estimated de that an olive plantation with 20 years of age can capture 50,000 kilos no of CO2. So farmer, the farming is not part of the uh, problem of the climate change, but rather it's part of the solution. And also society at large should acknowledge it. Reconocido. Antes de la this pandemia, was something that occurred in be, before the pandemic, when society was right there behind el agriculture. Si todo el mundo ha asumido, y con esto yo creo que es un compromiso is aware of this situation, this is a commitment that we must si all support. If everyone is aware that paga, the polluter pays, then it is time now for Those tanto, who decontaminate uh, should every cent that they receive Pero under the CAP. Subsidies and grants under the CAP are not simply money that is provided. It is also an investment for sustainability. And I uh, would like to repeat now what our moderator said regarding what is being decided in the reform of the CAP. Some people want to cut back the funds, and even the Spanish government is saying that they are going to provide less subsidies to the Spanish farmers. I would like to say here in Andalusia and in Seville, that the Andalusian uh, farmers are doing a lot in favor of sustainability.
will be pleasant vacías. and uh, empty words. I think what the farmers eh, need is con uh, compensation and a very paz. clear support. And now that we are about to conclude the si reform, I think we have to get down to what is actually important. And this is what the European People's Party, the Spanish People Party, is doing. And here in Andalusia, Juan Moreno is also working on this. We have to trust the farming sector and consider it a partner in the fight against climate change. Otherwise, we should simply disregard the sector and not consider it a partner for the fight against climate change. I think the People's Party is doing things right, and this is not, but this is not the case of the Socialist Party. So I think we have to trust in the ability to reach a reasonable reform of the common agricultural policy. I hope that this can be solved, and I would like to request the Minister Planas to continue in the wake of other important agricultural ministers that have existed in Spain and who were all uh, part of the uh, farmers in Spain and in Andalusia and in Europe. Thank you very much, Juan Ignacio. I'm not sure if you have to leave or not. Maybe you can stay for the debate. I am going to listen to Ricardo Serra before I leave. Fantastic. I will now give the voice to the farmers. Ricardo, go ahead then. Thank you. Really reconforting to listen to Miguel and to Juan Ignacio, who are experts in this area and with whom I have worked hand in hand over the years. And it has also been important to hear what Miguel has said about the new possibilities. This event is very interesting because uh, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, we will be completing the agreement to reform the uh, CAP, and this will have an impact on what we do until 2030. And I think the European Parliament has a big role to play because they, have to, they will take part in the co-decisions, and the European Parliament, with a few exceptions, by the Greens and the uh, people who are uh, environmentalists. And they base their logic not in scientific uh, facts, but in certain dogmas. And they don't seem to be able to be able to support their uh, position with scientific facts. Farming is blamed for 7% of uh, greenhouse emissions, and this was said by the Ecological Transition Minister, and 27% of GHE is from transport, 17% industry, 18 fuel consumption. So in Andalusia, where the agricultural load is lower, De, de, de gases de efecto invernadero, on a GHE. Well, I think that these uh, figures are important eh, to bear in no mind. Mucho sobre el, el, I don't want to dwell too much on the porque objects or goals of the Green Deal, because what really affects the farmer is the 50% use of phytosanitary programs by 2030, 30% of nitrogenous uh, chemical products, 25% of uh, agricultural land must be used for organic farming, 20% to landscape, 50% of uh, waste must be also uh, reduced. So why do we say 50%? Why not 30? Why not 40? Why not 60%? When we create a project such as this one, we establish certain goals, and we also put into place how to achieve those goals, and then we carry out an impact assessment study. 
We have to see how much this is going to cost, but there are no impact assessments or are there any, because if there are any, they are being kept in a drawer until the CAP reform is complete, as apparently this impact assessment does not go in favor of what some people want. The North American Agriculture Department, who is probably worried about the impact impact of the Green Deal on their economies. And I am going to read through this report. I would like to simply highlight some of the paragraphs, and I'm reading textually the document to determine which is the impact of this proposal. We have carried out simulation of the policies and the goals using different scenarios in this initiative, the totality of the scenarios has shown that the reduction of the inputs have an impact on the farmers of a green uh, farming that would have an impact on 12%, that is to say that farms would be less productive. This would lead to a lack of protection for these farmers. The adoption of these strategies would also have an impact beyond the European Union, leading to increases in the prices of the food across the world, and this is only taking into account the European Union. If we take into account other countries, it will be an increase of 89%. This will have an impact on the consumers and would lead to a uh, worse living conditions for the citizens. We estimate that the higher prices of food would increase in 2022 million the people who are living in a more vulnerable situation across the world. And overall, it would affect 185 million people across the world. So we are establishing very ambitious goals without actually measuring the impact that it will have, without actually foreseeing how to mitigate the impact of these policies. The European Social Committee has uh, published three reports on the Green Deal. I cannot uh, go deeply into what it says, but I would like to read one of the paragraphs. The degradation of the environment is uh, has a, impact, a strong and adverse impact on the air, land, and in particular the urban areas, leading to the abandonment of certain areas where the landscape will deteriorate if we do not carry out the necessary mitigation measures. What they're trying to say here is, is that if the rural world is not sustainable, then people will emigrate to the cities. There will be larger depopulation, and this will lead to adverse effects on the environment which affects us all. Even the Commission, the European Commission, in one of its reports, and I would like to quote again, the European Commission does not consider that the sector can carry out large reductions, so the this would have a minimal impact on GHE. It considers that the ambitions go far beyond what one should be expected because the margin of improvement would reach a limit and this would have to be revisited if necessary. As Juan Ignacio has said, the farmers are the first ones who are convinced about the adverse effect that environmental changes can have, in particular on the areas where they live, in the rural areas, there can be greater desertification, extreme temperatures, uh, extreme events in terms of uh, the climate. So we are the first ones who are interested in ensuring that this actually works well. However, the burden of this situation should not be maybe in the hands of the farmers, but we must also compensate them for the efforts they will be making. I heard this uh, sentence, or this phrase, by the, one of the farmers who went to the economic, social and economic uh, committee, he said the farmers cannot be green if their numbers are in red.
Pues muchas gracias Ricardo. Thank you very much, much Ricardo. Thank you very much Juan Ignacio and of eh, course Miguel. Claro, I think eh, uh, the situation is quite clear. Ricardo's uh, presentation has been very clear. The farmers are the first ones uh, who are interested in ensuring that this green revolution moves forward but with the necessary support. One of the most important economic sectors in Andalusia is the agricultural sector, and this is on what the People's Party in Andalusia is working on. We are all very aware of this situation, and we'll have to wait and see what happens tomorrow, the day after tomorrow in Brussels, Monday, Tuesday in Luxembourg. Let us hope that everything works out fine so that it can benefit everyone. And we will now move on to the third panel. We are still behind schedule. Uh, let us ask the next panelists uh, to come up here.
Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes ya. Good afternoon. Vamos a dar comienzo a, esta, a este último panel de, sobre la Revolución Verde en Andalucía. La Revolución Verde, que hemos podido ver que está perfectamente alineada con los principios que emanan de Europa y que está materializada en, en hechos concretos, ¿no? Como ha puesto de manifiesto nuestras construcciones generales, nuestras estructuras puestas en marcha, eh, proyectos ejecutados, planificaciones aprobadas, investigaciones que no conocen a, a los objetivos comunes, ¿no? que es materializar la, la Revolución Verde. Ahora podemos decir que, que esta Revolución Verde recibe aportaciones de, de distintos sectores, la revolución will also receive funds from different institutions, not only the regional government, but also civil society and private sector. And this is something that is made evident by the members of this panel, Jose Maria, who is the mayor of Estepona, a member of the European Committee of the Regions. He will be talking to us about what are the constitutions made by the local authorities. Well, Thank you very much. Good afternoon to one and all. Thank you very much. Well, this is a day for reflection, so I want to focus on three ideas, very specific ideas, because this morning we have already heard that the, there is a green revolution, there is a new environmental movement that has to focus on the cities, on the urban areas. The three ideas I want to share with you to try to do away with the myth, first of all, whether it is convenient or not for the cities to grow. Second, whether it is convenient or not that the cities is be compact or extensive. And third, that the non-urban areas must not be used for uh, housing. First of all, with regard to the growth of the cities, well, I put this in doubt. It is true that we have to build a cycle lanes, a green areas, make sure that the transport system is non-polluting. I think we can do more in this sense. We have to carry out an exercise of human geography to see how much can a city grow, what is the maximum growth that it can have, the maximum number of inhabitants can one city have. For example, in the case of Estepona, where there are 8,000 inhabitants, we all agree that you can't have two, three, or five million inhabitants. inhabitants, there is a logical limit. When a city reaches a certain level of population in which it can have enough services, then we have to make a political and administrative effort to try to rationalize this growth because we would have to think growth for what reason and for whom. If there are no people that really need that growth, then why should we grow? Any city, when they analyze these parameters, and we see which are the limits, to really engage in this unreasonable growth does not seem logical. If you have a certain number of kilometers of coast, if you, coast, if you have a certain number of services, if you have certain car parks that are also limited, when you have this already in place and you look at these parameters to try to go into an unlimited growth that really doesn't make sense. So urban planning has to look into this. We have to rationalize how this growth takes place. Another myth that I think we should look into is the myth of a compact city. Europe tells us that cities must grow starting from what already exists. You have like concentric circles. This is a mantra in Europe and even the lista or the lay on urban land in Andalusia, which is yet to be approved, but the People's Party has really invested huge efforts in this law. Well, I hope that it will soon be approved. And one, has, one thing that is important about this law is how compact a city should be. And I think we have to question this. We have to uh, look into whether this is truly applicable, because we have seen that during the pandemic, people have tried to move out of the cities. They did not want to live in cities. They want to live in isolated places. 
in the Costa del Sol, where I am from, I am the mayor of Estepona. We have seen that there are compact examples like Torremolinos and Benalmadena, which whose quality of life has a drop with regard to Estepona, Benajavi, and Marbella, because we are not a compact city. So this myth of a compact city is something that we should question, call into question. And the third idea, and with this I conclude, is this prohibition in, within the Spanish legislation stating that you cannot uh, uh, build or live or uh, even uh, do anything with land. That is undeveloped. If we can live, if we can work in the fee, in the in the hinterland, in the farmlands, why are we not not allowed to live there as well? After a given a minimum size of land, why don't we allow people to live there? Obviously, with all the necessary guarantees and precautions and the services, etc., why not allow people to live on the land? There are some farms that have thousands and thousands of hectares, but they are not allowed to build a house on it. Isn't that the best way to do things? The people who live in these in the hinterland, in the rural areas, are the ones that are going to be more concerned about ensuring that everything works well, there are no fires, and and the environment is properly protected. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for your thoughts on how the city should grow. Obviously, this is something that we have to take into account, and we all agree that we must be in our sustainability criteria for these cities to grow. It, I am sure that this no, new law that you have just mentioned, LISTA, will also be approved in a short. I am going to give the floor now to Romano Romero, who is the Commissioner for Climate Change and Revolution, and he will be talking, he is contributing to this green revolution to different agencies that can implement these policies towards the green revolution, and he will be talking to us about the details of this green revolution. Thank you very much, Maria. I'd first of all like to thank you all, and as we don't have very much time left, I am going to focus on the actual state of the art of Andalusia, the struggle against climate change, and the actual content of the Green Revolution. Like our president has said during the opening ceremony, the bet for the Green Revolution is clear and decisive. We have our eyes on 2050 to become a decarbonized region, but uh, we want to reach this goal soon. International commitments, whether it is the Paris Agreement or 230 Agenda, force us to take upon challenges that in some cases are very difficult to achieve. But at the same time, it's an opportunity, a huge economic opportunity that Andalusia has at her hands. The geographical position of Andalusia means that uh, she is going to be one of the regions that is going to suffer most climate change. At the same time, the option of renewables they ha she has is very important because it's going to allow us to replace traditional sources of energy like coal, other energies for new ones like solar energy, wind energy, but less known ones like biomass, where Andalusia has a huge potential to tap into. In order to have a clear idea of what we're talking about, when we talk about the Green Revolution, we can not only talk about the environmental transition, because it includes other 
things. An example of a green transition in the field of energy today would be the fact that we are developing, uh, working with different projects where there is an important level of private investment with no incentive, which is more than 18,000 million euros. And an installed capacity or potential installed capacity of more than 20,000 megawatts. In order to understand what I'm talking about, the National Plan for Climate and Energy foresees huge amounts of energy for 2030 and 2050 which entail that uh, the volumes that we're working within in Andalusia would represent more than 40% for some sources of energy, more specifically solar energy. We have green hydrogen that's come in recently, and uh, though it is quite an old and mature source of energy, it is... Uh, becoming increasingly important today. Green hydrogen also offers us huge opportunities. We have our industrial estates in Huelva, in the port of Algeciras. We have uh, the possibilities of exporting from these places. Apart from energy, to make the green revolution become true, we also need uh, the legal framework to develop in other areas. And this is precisely the effort that is being made by the Andalusian regional government through its regional ministries. Just like Francis said before, the legal initiative on the circular economy in the sphere of environmental matters is something that we have at hand that is accompanied by sustainable development. Because when we talk about the Green Revolution, it has a lot of substantive matter to it in Andalusia. What we wish to achieve is a far more resistant economy, a more modern economy, a more resilient economy, and why? So that in the future, apart from creating jobs and economic development, to ensure that the region will be able to face the challenges it has ahead even better. It also provides us a huge opportunity for Andalusia not only to become a reference at a national and European level, but also worldwide, and the government is going to work towards this. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Juan Manuel. As Andalusia is a huge land of opportunities, not only due to the sunlight and idiosyncrasy, but also due to the technical ability and investment in our energy, which are always going to lead to sustainable development. This transition has led to the Green Revolution. Now, with no further ado, I'd like to give the word to Juan Ramón Carmona, spokesperson at the Andalusian Parliament of Agriculture and sustainable development, who will tell us about what is being done from the legal point of view, supporting measures that are as significant and important as the Andalusian Water Pact. Thank you, Maria, for your kind words and the hard work you've done. I would like to thank the colleagues who have joined me. How many minutes do I have? 25? Zero. Okay. In zero minutes, I'm going to summarize absolutely everything that we do in the Andalusian Parliament. When Juan Manuel Moreno talks about the Green Revolution, in its day, everybody thought that it was just a show off like Sanchez is doing, but when they saw that we're actually doing things and becoming a reference for other territories, not only in Spain and Europe, they may start listening to us. Why? Because the Green Revolution is the Green Andalusia for Andalusia. So that everybody knows what we're talking about. Andalusia is like a pilot project where everything has to happen. But this is what I mean to say we have more risks than anybody else, because just like Francis was saying before, we pues are in a situation si where mar, if the sea level goes up, what's going to happen? We have si 1,000 kilometers eh, of uh, coastline. Eh, if there is a severe futuro, desertification Andalucía process, no there's no doubt that Andalusia is going to be the first to suffer from it. And it will climb uh, 
Through the rest of the spectrum, there are several Spain that has a future threat, but also strengths, and a quicker political strength. Some people say, I'm an Andalusian, so which environmental challenges do you mean when we win you to? That's why Andalusia is a leader in organic production. In many other matters, such as the capacity to adapt for new renewables, and for many other reasons that are linked to agriculture, modern and innovative agriculture, as the president of ASA has said before, because we have proven during the pandemic that Andalusia is the solution so the largest in Europe are not empty, so that there's no chaos in Europe when you cannot see basic commodities available. And this can only be guaranteed by Andalusia. That is why the CAP is so important for us. That is why we're risking so much in environmental matters in Europe, but we have to be seen as an opportunity because we are an example of that. Human actions have proven through our projects of conservation are important, like the three national parks we have today, because of the park Sierra de las Nieves will be the third one in the region after Doñana and Sierra Nevada. So it's an opportunity, another quick reflection I would like to make here. Never tried to... Show the environmental example of example of Bolidana, the pipeline under Doñana, the composting plants that don't compost in the south of mountains in Seville, which are scandals, projects that are scandals, which we've already heard about, cannot be an example of what we're talking about. The last demonstration is going to have to do something about it, like that are reconditioned. Dismantle no, vamos a tomar lecciones de nadie, pero sí tenemos muy claro que tenemos que medir el impacto que se genera, que la agricultura innovadora hay que apoyarla, que no hay que convertirlo en un problema para los agricultores, que hay que ir de la mano, que tienen que ver las ventajas. Yo decía un poco el otro día en una reflexión rápida y voy terminando. Hombre, yo voy y me compro una Coca-Cola ahora en el McDonald's, ¿vale? Y me dan una pajita que no es de plástico y es de cartón. Hombre, pues me Okay, well, I don't like it, I don't know who has been told that such a cardboard is nice, but it's not. But I understand those are the tiny things that we have to adapt to when we talk about adaptation to more, you know, sustainable evidentemente el uso del plástico para un solo uso. Pero más allá de esta broma, tengo que decir que tenemos que hacerlo de verdad we have to do it as a solution that is not permanently making people angry. Let me give you an example. We can't tell citizens that we're going to increase electricity rates or diesel rates or all the taxes for their good because that's going to contribute to less pollution. That is not true. What you need to do is to get more important to good actions and just like governments like that. Andalusian want to support pushing forward a electricity and transformation. We had to try to do things better, but you know, every year we had to pay 8 million euros for polluting, for throwing our waste into rivers and seas. It has to be changed. How do we change it? With 500 million euros that are going to be invested this year, next year, that it is possible to have a new water policy, a new water culture. Like that has has been achieved with the Andalusia water agreement subscribed by all political parties. The Socialist Party took the picture but did not vote in favour of this, which is proof that they had something to hide after so many years turning the Greens away. And this is also true that the Green Revolution is true. This has been said by the President of the Andalusian community very often. We don't really have to believe this, but we have to prove it like the regional government is doing pero it, tenemos que intentar ser lo más pedagógicos posibles para que no generemos cada and vez uh, más enemigos del cambio climático por las incomodidades que le vamos creando en el camino hacia llegar a los objetivos más grandes. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Eh, yo creo que las dos conclusiones fundamentales que podemos sacar de la mesa es... Here, 
is that the Green Revolution is a fact and it's supported on specific facts, sustainable energy, water management, technologies, the Andalusian action for uh, climate change, uh, the air, better atmosphere, and so on and so forth, which is something that we're all pushing forward from all the different areas of society. And this is something that I believe we should be proud of and congratulate ourselves as Andalusians for it. And with this, I would like to hereby close this session. And now we're going to give the floor to Antonio Lopez Isteri, Secretary General of the European People's Party and MEP. And the event will be closed by Mr. Ol Geert Geblewicz, President of the Popular of the European People's Party at the Committee of the Regions. Well, first of all, I would like to thank this initiative to the, our group, to Chichi Costas, I would like to send you a warm greeting from Brussels, also to the president of the Junta de Andalucía, Mr. Juan Maria Moreno, the regional minister for the presidency, Mr. Ben Dodo. And I have also seen my colleague. European People's Party, Katia de Miguel, who has made this event possible, Antonio and many others. It is really a pleasure to be able to greet so many friends. Climate change. Climate change is a global problem that requires global solutions. I think it is under the People's Party has been the one who uh, has been a pioneer with their climate law. Global warming is a reality, and some people simply try to use this as a banner for their ideologies only. But we take this very seriously. As Juan Mamorena said, the climate law is one of the main pillars of the European Commission's Green Deal, and it is led by Ursula von der Leyen, a member of the European Green Party. It talks about how to reduce emissions and reach our goal by 2050. It also fosters competitiveness within the European Union without leaving anyone behind. And this is something that also differentiates us from other uh, people who have a popular position. We see the challenges, and we want to make these challenges compatible with the current situation of the climate. The recovery and resilience funds are also going to be a focal point for this recovery to be able to fund the different measures that will be That has already reached a, a, a its goal here in Spain. We all have comprehensive experience in climate change. We are led by Miguel Angel Cañete, who was one of the people who were uh, key to the Paris Accords, and this has been recognized across the world. This group was created in 2020, and despite the very difficult situations of the pandemic, they have met virtually with the different decision makers of the European Party at the regional, national, and European level to support the European climate uh, green deal. I would like to thank the Committee of the Regions, the European People's Party, and the debates that have been organized today with leaders at the local, regional, national, and European level to ensure that we can also implement the European climate law in due time. During tomorrow's plenary session, as different speakers have mentioned, the European Parliament will vote to approve this law. And this has a binding effect on all member states we have to achieve the climate neutrality by 2050. And this is a very important step towards the implementation of the Paris Accord.
problem that requires global solutions. Local and regional authorities are the ones that are closest to the citizens, and we are seeing a common effort all must be involved and this is why the european people's party will continue to work with the, the andalusian european people's party who i would like to insist once and again dear juama dear elias dear, dear friends this party has been a pioneer in green transition and this is a true example of how we have to deal with a climate neutral and new climate neutral society. Thank you very much for your attention. Dear friends, uh, it is my great honor and privilege to close today's local dialogue. And of course, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to President uh, Juanma Moreno for inv invitation to uh, this beautiful, vivid, and vibrant region of Andalusia. Uh, and to, to address you, uh, during this first EPP local dialogue after launching the conference on the future of Europe. So I'm very happy that right here in Seville we discuss our local matters, we discuss our future uh, in the framework of the conference of the future uh, of Europe as a first. Uh, I have to admit that it is third time I have a possibility to visit Seville and every time I'm really impressed by hospitality and uh, welcome uh, I get here. But uh, during last year I'm really, really delighted that uh, I can see how the Andalusia how the region, in fact, can really transform itself for the better under the leadership of the EPP, our EPP member, President Juanma Moreno. And I would like to congratulate him and congratulate you. It is really great work. So please accept my congratulations on that. Climate change uh, has been for a long time among uh, the top priorities of the EU citizens and it is in the fact and it is fact that it is taken seriously by us mm, the leaders of EPP in every corner of Europe of course it was taken seriously but Ursula von der Leyen but Thanks to this, today's discussion, I can see that it was taken seriously by, by President Moreno. And I can ensure you that uh, it is taken seriously by me itself. Uh, I would like to share some experiences from my region. I am a president of one of the, of the biggest Polish region, West Pomerania region, located on the Baltic Sea. Uh, on the, it is bordering region with the Germany, uh, so uh, we have a plenty of good examples uh, how make our reality green. Uh, I am really proud that uh, my region is the biggest producer of renewable energy. Uh, I was informed right now that uh, Andalusia is leader in, uh, in uh, photovoltaic uh, energy production. Uh, my region is very windy region, uh, so we mainly produce uh, energy from, uh, from uh, windmills. But I have to underline that 20% of Polish renewable energy is created in my region. 
uh, that it, this production covers in the 73% our, our average annual energy consumption in our region. So I'm really proud that thanks to some kind of good environment in my region, it could develop so dramatically. And it is our way how we would like to perform. Uh, such a program to allow people to modernize their heating systems and only in last two years we managed to uh, we managed to re reduce uh, reduce CO2 emission uh, more than 14,000 tons so it, it is comparable to planting over the 2000 uh, 2003. So, so we do our best to clean our clean up our air. Uh, the third example, it is uh, the public transport. In Poland, uh, regional authorities are responsible for regional regional trains. Uh, so, right now, we are the first region in Poland and one of the first regions in Europe uh, which have the hybrid uh, propels trains, so trains with uh, hybrid engines, with electric and diesel, uh, as not all uh, railway lines are electrified, we can use, we can choose, we don't have to pollute uh, in the, in the uh, lines when we don't need it, uh, to pollute it, thanks to that. So we have plenty of good examples and, uh, and we, we can see that it is our choice to be green as a, our as a local and regional authorities and as a EPP leaders. So these examples we have raised here today clearly demonstrate, in my opinion, three things. First, local and regional leaders are driving force uh, in implementing green transitions as we are responsible for a 90% of climate adaptation measures and 17% of climate mitigation policies. What is more, we, uh, we manage one third public spending as a local and regional authorities in Europe. One, third public spending and two-thirds of public investment. So it is impossible to reach our green aims without harshing the, our investment in green aims. Second, as the EPP family, we are driving force in the in the green aims and we have plenty, plenty, plenty of good practices. We, uh, we discussed it today about the practices in Andalusia, as I was told you a little bit about the good practices in my region, but we have uh, thousands of such examples performed by our EPP leaders. So all we need right now to we have to realize people that we are doing it for them and with them, uh, just like European People Party do it on the ordinary basis. And third, we are committed and ambitious with a climate target, but we need more resources. We need direct EU funds for local and regional authorities implementing Green Deal projects. As your president, Juan Moreno, underlined in his COR opinion uh, on the climate law. So we have to be, we are 
very realistic politicians. We are, are aware that if we have ambitious goals, we have to have additional resources. So it is the third point from today's discussions. And dear friends, just to briefly sum up, we have to think why we should do it, what for? Why we need this green revolution? I think that it is all about responsibility. European People Party, our people in every corner of Europe have been always responsible. We were and we are responsible for our citizens. We are responsible for our families. And we are responsible for our children. So it is about responsibility when we're talking about green Europe. Because our dream is to pass our villages, our cities, our regions to our children as a green, clean places with a good perspective to live, with a good environment, healthy and wealthy. So this green revolution is about our EPP responsibility. Thank you very much.